this is an introduction and it's about the structures and tactics and, and a little bit about the philosophy and the history. I'm Nandini, but you probably all figured that out. Um, I, am, I have organized most of the stuff at SETI. I'm a mathematician by trade. My background was in cryptography for a long time. Um, which got a little sketchy given its relevance in the world and the fact that I'm a foreign citizen for a lot of it. Um, and, and I also, um, so I moved to a little more abstract mathematics, something called algebraic geometry, where what I studied was um, what happens when multidimensional universes collide, which is like completely beautiful and useless. Um, <laughs> but, but early on, um, in the cryptography, I was very involved in, in, so most of my experience with programming is as a cryptographer, not as a computer scientist. I started a little bit as a computer scientist in the early 90s. Um, and, I, I th um, and I was working with people who were doing AI. I was on their research projects. What was really sad about the early 90s is it, it was mostly philosophical. You couldn't really do anything because computers then were like kind of, Really bad. Um, you couldn't really compute anything. So the nice thing about it is that you learned a lot about what the ideas and the concepts and what's possible and what's not. So I am going to bring that to, to this, um, which is another way of also saying, I think of computer programming as a, a very, a creative problem solving skill. So it's really about like figuring out here's this tool we can do to be really clever and lazy to solve problems and less about the syntax of the language. And you should, and I do that because it's now much more relevant, but um, languages change. Whatever you learn, the syntax is gonna change. Each iteration of the same language is often not backwards compatible. And each um, troubleshooting syntax is something that is frustrating, takes a long time, is tedious, and should never be done in public was what one of my professors told me. Um, it's something you struggle with in your own, just like, you know, it's the process of making, and so there's like lots of mistakes. Um, but anyway, so I think of, uh, so I'm gonna, and also we only have two hours to do an entire semester or a year of computer science, so we might as well do it a little differently. Um, this is the, we're not going to uh, actually write the code for this, although it's like really trivial. It's like five lines of code. But I'm going to end with this, which is the sort of most complex idea we'll work with today. Um, but I want to talk a little bit so you get an idea of why computer, why it's important to write not, where te the second reason why we do not want to learn syntax in writing really trivial programs is now we know how to turn, teach machines to do that for you soon. We're not going to need to write simple programs. We're going to write hard programs, and interesting programs that actually solve real problems. So I'm going to start with sort of what I think of the history. I know there was like Babbage and Ada Lovelace and all of that, but I think of the history of this field as computer science and as coming from sort of right before World War II, um, where Church and Turing talked about wrote a paper about what is actually computable. What does it mean to say a computer can do this work? And are there limits to it? Is everything computable? Is mathematics computable? Is there someday going to be a computer program that you can feed in a mathematical hypothesis and it will give you a proof? Or is all of biology computable? So can I take a system and model it perfectly and completely and answer every question? And that's what a computation is. Um, and um, and mathematicians were very interested in it at the, at the time. So this was purely a logical question. Computers did not exist. Programs did not exist. Um, it was purely a logical question, and it was something mathematicians were interested in. We now have a system to model mathematics. Does that mean mathematics is dead? Is it, is it a really a philosophy, or does it mean someday there's going to be a machine that you turn in, you throw in your question, and it turns out an answer? Um, and I will talk about universal Turing machines maybe towards the end. Um, and Turing was a logician, was completely theoretical, would never have actually done anything about it other than like speculate and prove theorems, amazing theorems. Um, but World War II happened. Um, and so suddenly that became an interesting question for more than mathematicians because um, for one thing, Turing and some other people were sequestered at Bletchley Park. Um, they were forced to work on real world problems, which 
most mathematicians of, of who did logic avoid at, at all costs, um, and, and forced to interact with other kinds of thinkers. So there were lots of different way, people in there. And, um, and Turing was made to solve problems that were not that exciting, like what is the limits of computation. They were trying to break codes. And this is where programming comes in. If, if you start doing things enough, you can start to see patterns for them of how to solve things, problems. If you work on certain kinds of problems enough, you start to find patterns, but, and then you create a method. And think of like basic, your quadratic formula or your things you do in calculus. You realize, oh, I'm trying to figure out what is the optimal, like the maximum or minimum for this physical or biological phenomena, but there's a, 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 a mindless recipe for it. We always teach the mindless recipe, but the interesting part is the person who figured out, oh, there's a mindless recipe for it which means I can get a machine to do it. I can write a program and a computer will do it for me. So like programming is just a way to be very clever and lazy and outsource like the, the tedious part of your work. Um, and so when they started trying to break the codes, they started coming up with methods of how to get it. These codes are still really hard to make because the cipher machines people were using and if you've never seen the Enigma or the Lawrence, you should look at it. They're just gorgeous, beautiful mechanical machines, but they're finite. And, but you still need a lot of computation to really break codes really, really quickly because they change the codes every day. And um, there was a person who, um, there were several people, but there were engineers who were part of the team and they worked on machines and could build machines. And in particular, there was an engineer from the post office, the British postmaster general's office or something. His name was Tommy Flowers and he, um, Turing came up with the idea, built the first kind of mechanical sort of version of it, and Tommy Flowers built what was the first computer, we will never ever see it, um, called the Colossus. And that was kind of how they cracked a lot of the, the codes easily. At the end of the war, um, the British government did not want the Russians to find out they knew how to do this because they wanted the Russians who'd gone and taken the enigmas to still keep using it in East. Um, so they destroyed everything, all of the papers, all of the machines, everything. We have never seen a Colossus, we just knew it was there. They have now done a recreation in the museum, I think, but we've never seen the actual original. Um, what was even sadder um, was that all of those people who were there were kind of there and like it was classified, so they never got to go out and tell the world what they did or what they solved, and it was only in the 70s when it was all these classified we found out. Turing went back to Cambridge. Um, the British government decided he was homosexual and that was a bad idea and kind of um, drove him to suicide, um, arrested him, put him in jail. Um, and, yeah. um, and just to make sure people didn't forget how awful that was, in 2010, they pardoned him for his crime, um, just to bring it all back. Um, so, but he took those same ideas of the limits of computability and started thinking about what are the limits, but now more in the world. And he did two things. Um, one is he started thinking about is human intelligence computable? And this, I think, was the foundation. One more important thing happened during that um, time where Claude Shannon came up with the notion of information theories, which, again, allowed us to recognize information is computable um, in a certain way. Um, through physical machines. Um, but he started thinking about, is human intelligence computable? And also, he started thinking about, is biology a system? And like worked with like growing little crystals and artificial life and morphogenesis. Um, but that notion of where we are at today with computer science, it kind of, that's um, the idea. The human intelligence, everybody, that paper is very readable. It just says, you know, can you talk to a machine and recognize, is it a machine or is it a human? Um, when I teach semester-long computer science classes, I actually ask people that, like, how would you prove you weren't a machine? And I really have never been able to convincingly say I'm not. Um, like, every time I check off I'm not a robot, I'm like, how would I know, you know? <laughs> but, um, but I just wanted to give you a sense that we, 
we are trained to write such sort of silly, trivial code, and it's with very little things. But this was a really a way to understand the human mind and to solve really complex major problems. So really start thinking about computer programming as a way to solve sort of problems at a systemic level. And the building blocks are very simple. So what we're going to do today is what are the building blocks of sort of computer, computer programs? And the goal of a computer program is really to get the hardware, like to write in a language that the machine can understand and do the work. And what is the machine doing? The only pieces we need um, are logic. Can we frame our questions in a logical way that have a truth value as a true or false statement? Um, an algorithm, which is just a process. And when you think algorithm or a process, think of like describing to somebody a recipe for baking a cake or for packing a suitcase or something, and learning to think that way. Pattern recognition, which I want to talk about, even though it doesn't seem like the obvious thing to fit in, um, it's the thing I'm interested in, so we're going to talk about it. Um, and the most important piece is binary arithmetic and Boolean logic. Um, we are used to a decimal arithmetic that is not in some ways, it's natural because we can count on our fingers. It was the arithmetic that it came from India through the Muslims to Europe, to, through North Africa to Italy and Spain. Um, but it's not, there's nothing natural about it. Um, Babylonians did base 60, Egyptians did base 20, Mayans did base 20. Base 20 makes sense in another natural way because of fingers and toes. Um, machines do like base two for obvious reasons. So you'll see two, eight, and 16. But it's because of George Bull who realized there's a really, you can turn logic into statements about sort of that are true and false if you look at a binary system. Um, the nice thing about that is we can model a lot of mathematics that way and a lot of probability that way. Um, a coin flip has two choices. So it's, it's clear they're like two distinct parts, but you can also think of it as a switch on and off, and as, which means you can translate it into hardware as a gate that makes a connection or doesn't. And, and then the, you can expand the theory in saying more lo complicated logical statements can be built, are a series of combinations of zeros and ones which end up in like answers that are zeros and ones, and you can translate that into physical circuitry or logic gates. Um, and suddenly we have a path from making a series of logical statements to hardware. And that was the, the piece that was needed so that we can um, translate. But pattern recognition, um, this is the beginning of, this was what they were doing, cryptography, but this is what we're doing, say, how do you, how do you tell a machine? So I'm interested in the complex problems, like, can I get a machine to do arithmetic trivially? Can I get a machine to do anything I have a method for, the machine has a method for? But start thinking about, I recognize faces very easily. I can look at somebody's handwriting, which is totally different from mine, and I can recognize what they're writing in a language. Every single one of us will write the letter A differently, and some of us worse than others, like my handwriting has just evolved over time. We had to learn, we had handwriting and penmanship classes when I was in school, and it was never good then, and it's like so much worse. Um, but, but we can still, for the most part, recognize it. But the question is, can we get a machine to recognize it? And my first um, semester programming, I asked my students to try to write a program that would recognize the letter A. Well, recognize the alphabet. And after a while, we realized the alphabet is hard. Let's do the letter A. Let's do only capital letters. And then we're like, OK, let's just do the letter A. And we realize it's, in, it's incredibly hard because we do not know. It's the questions that we answer. We have algorithms for our brain does it very quickly. So it's found patterns that are really interesting to ask, can we write a computer program to do it? And every facial recognition software now is trying to do that, right? And is doing it to a certain extent, mostly worse than others. So we'll, in the interest of time, we'll just do the first one so we can start actually getting. Um, what is the next symbol that goes up there?
Does anyone want to draw it? Write it, guess it. Is it a number? Is it a letter? So we're good at finding patterns, but we're also good at making sort of assumptions, right? It's really hard for us to break the pattern that that's an M, or that's a heart, or that's an eight. But really, it's just the numbers one, two, three reflected across a vertical axis. And so the pattern is vertical symmetry and numbers. So, but this is the kind of thing you want to think about, like, how would we solve it? But how would we, you know, there's something where you're like, I can see an M, maybe it's a letters. We go through this process, right? So the question is, can you articulate that process to write a method so that a computer can solve it? So really when you're thinking about writing syntax, like just coding and recoding, web pages is not interesting. Like really thinking about what is, what is this thing? Can I teach a machine to write patterns? I wanna bring up bon, Bongard because he was this Russian um, computer scientist who was trying to do that. He was like, can, can I teach a machine to recognize patterns? And he had these patterns which were like, can you tell me why this pat set of six is different from this? And why this set of six? is different from this. And when I started studying computer science, we had to spend a lot of time doing like bongard like problems um, to see if we could be, I guess, a good enough AI ourselves. Um, and we can like spend some time, and I, I'll share the slides later if people are interested, and you can spend some time working on it. But it's those kinds of questions that are really interesting that also tell us what is possible and what is computable and what are the limits of it. Um, and not just how to get one little widget working on our website, you know? Which is another thing I want to say now. We are in the world where everything is called AI, and I don't know, Matt, if you want to jump into my rant, but I'm going to rant, um, which is I was at this conference of scientists this, this past weekend, all doing different things. It was kind of interesting. It was an unconference, and we were all discussing. And there were a bunch of computer scientists who were like, this is not AI, AI is not dangerous, what we have is just like mundane. And there were a lot of scientists who were like, we're gonna use this and it's gonna solve all our problems. But what we have right now, the thing that is called AI, is really not AI. It is not, um, it's not particularly intelligent if it is biased and it's making terrible decisions, it's because the data it's given that humans created and the algorithms are given are created by people <laughs> who are biased and it's incomplete. Um, but it's also, it's important to remember because we've just every time called something AI because it's a fad, we're nowhere even close to that. Um, and you'll, we'll talk a little bit about the limits of why this current maybe programming mindset isn't gonna get us there particularly quickly. Um, but the other issue is we are asking these questions of we don't know how it makes this decision. But here's the thing. When I, toss, when I toss a coin, and imagine it's a perfectly fair coin, what do I know about it? I know for certain I'll get heads or tails. I do not know at all why I get heads or tails. I do know and I can prove that over time, it'll be clo it gets closer to about 50-50. But on a single coin toss, I don't know which it's gonna be. And, and I should not be trying to answer, and I think answering questions about whether the current AI is really AI is like trying to answer the question, we don't know what the coin is doing in choosing whether to be heads or tails. That's not the point. We know it has to be one or the other. The coin is not choosing, it's not making decisions, and we should not attribute sentience or intelligence to that coin. And I think AI is just a like scaled version currently of that same concept. We are incorporating a probabilistic model, which means we do know for certain at any given stage how that decision is made. We do know long-term possible probabilities. We can talk about likelihoods, but we shouldn't attribute intelligence to the model when there isn't, um, or decision-making capability. So while it would be lovely to have AI, maybe, we don't. We just have just the ingredients we're gonna talk about today that you would do in a first semester computer science. One other piece about algorithms that I want to think about, this notion of trying to make fractals and complex visual things, which we are going to try to create, is not a new concept. Um, it came up in mathematics and in geometry um, and in logic. Um, Kant, Georg Cantor was a 19th century Russian-German mathematician, um, and he was trying to understand, is it possible to create infinite things when we only can handle finite things? Is there something called infinity 
Is there just one infinity? Turns out there are lots of infinities. He did not like that. He spent most of his life trying to prove himself wrong because he did prove there were multiple. There were infinitely many infinities. Um, it did not make him happy. Um, but he came up with this other idea that led to the geometers who were studying um, space and notions of dimension and geometry started looking at is can we push the notion of a dimension to a limit? What, can you create a curve? So the idea is this thing is a plane, but this is just a, a curve, a line. Can I create a curve that's purely just a curve, it's not coloring swaths in that fills a two-dimensional space that's bordering on two-dimensional space? And how would I come up with it? Um, I can't come up with a formula for it, and that's where the notion of like a really interesting complex algorithm came up. Um, Matt's gonna teach next Thursday's thing, so we're trying not to truly crash on each other, and it's, um, so, so you look at this, and you're like, how would I tell a computer how to draw it? And it looks elaborate and complicated, and you can start to see picture, the idea of a fractal in there. But it's actually, they're very simple rules, and so this is what, when you're starting to code, can you break them down into a really simple set of rules, processes, and methods? And it basically says, you're gonna draw two lines that are at a right angle, and you, that's your building block piece. That's your basic building block, right? You're gonna take one of those, you're gonna take that, duplicate, and so maybe let's think about algorithms, like here's my first piece, or maybe that could be my second if you, thought about just a line as my first piece. Um, I'm gonna take that piece, I'm gonna rotate it, uh, sh duplicate it, make two copies, shrink, scale, maybe scale sounds more mathematical, so let's write scale, and rotate or position. And now I can think of writing a computer program that does it, right? So now I have, here's my thing, I have two copies, I could start with anything, I could start with cats. Like, take a cat, duplicate, shrink it, rotate in position, and then, so one rotates this way, the other rotates the other way. Um, take that piece, shrink it, um, rotate, rotate, and repeat. Each step gives me complexity really quickly. This is about like eight steps, it's not that much. But if you ask somebody to draw this, it would take hours and hours and hours. And especially those of you who don't write programs and try to draw an illustrator, um, it would take a long, long time. So algorithms allow you to be lazy and to ask a machine to do it, especially if it's a repetitive process. Um, this is called the dragon curve. Um, so this is the beginning of like the kind of drawing you might want to do. And what are the rules? So my building block is one line. How many pieces do I want in the second line? Yeah, if we want all the pieces to be the same, I go times eight. How, how much am I shrinking by? Scale by about a quarter of the original line and then position all eight. So once you start thinking of it that way, like can I see the pattern? The pattern is like this is a line and that's all it is and then you're scaling. And in four steps we've gotten something reasonably complex. Like intricate that looks like I, I did lace or thing. So this is where, and, and then this is where the idea of a fractal comes in, which is what, it, what did I do after each stage? So how many lines, we had four? and then we arranged. But again, we're getting complex, little bit of complex shapes. And if you will, um, the original question, this is called a, co a piece of a snowflake. The question is, if you do that to an actual snowflake, a six-sided snowflake, which apparently I've lost the ability to draw and I'm not even gonna try, um, can you have a finite area and you keep going forever, what happens to the length of the boundary? And it turns out the boundary goes to infinity. So you have the size of the snowflake does not change by very much. It's still occupying the same thing. But the, the boundary goes to infinity. It goes really quickly, the size grows. But this is still looks like, eh, this is all nice, but this is great if you're drawing mathematical objects, right? 
But what if you're trying to draw ferns? What if you're trying to draw a forest or a coastline or a, a mountain range? What if you're trying to do landscapes? And why do you want to do that? Because the entire movie industry and the gaming industry is kind of based on that now. Lots of very intricate, beautiful, lush, computer-generated imagery. You add one piece to this, um, which is probability. Just a little bit of randomness. And you say, and you can make whatever rules you want, but I'm going to say, I'm going to start with that line. I'm going to make it into four. Each time, those are all one third the size. But I'm going to add a coin toss. And every time I take the line, I'm going to say, oh, 50% of the time, I'm going to do this. And 50% of the time, I'm going to do this. Or another way to make it a little bit stranger is to say, I'm going to change, I'm going to do four pieces, but they're not all the same size. One of them is a little longer, one of them is a little shorter, or the angle is not 60 degrees. But even this, let's pick a series of coins tosses. Let's say heads, heads, tails, heads. After one size, I have this, um, I have that, tails. And that. And then I pick another series of coin tosses. And you notice already in that step, it started to look less, less regular, more complex. And so if you just do it as a series of coin tosses, in a very few steps, you get some very messy, crinkly things. You write yourself a program, and you can get that. This is generated by about starting with very simple things, adding color adding um, not written in processing. It would take a little more in processing, um, but it's not that, that hard. Um, the last piece um, that I want to talk about before we actually start programming, but this is why it's, it's worth, you know, like if you can get to complexity quickly, which now you can, you are gonna do fractals a little bit in L systems, right? Yeah. So, I will talk about it, but you'll learn how to actually do it next week in processing with, um, with now. Although I might get to one, just because I love this stuff. I will get to something at the end if we have time. But I, I wanted to say that, that this is what you should be thinking about, the potential, especially those of you who are artists, like how, or, or even doing ecology or biology, how can you push the limits of what you can model with code? And code allows you to do it very quickly. It allows you to be clever and lazy. Sometimes it takes a lot of work to be clever and lazy, <laughs> but it allows you eventually to be clever and lazy. Because once you have your algorithm, you can change pieces in it, and suddenly you're doing like a meadow of flowers rather than a mountain or something. But you understand, you can like tweak your algorithm. And there's one other piece of thing that's really important, which is we start with some information and then we're keeping track of it over time. So we need data structures and we need um, two things, which is how we access things and how, um, and how we translate that to hardware. So um, what keeps track of things and how do you um, look up something? Um, and this is really about how efficient or optimal is your computation. When you start coding, you do not care about that. And I, I think this is really important, and I'll talk about it when we start coding. Your time is worth much more than a machine, so always remember that. Like, write code so you can read it, and you can do it, and it takes more of the machine's time than your time. Eventually, when you're trying to do something really complicated, and the machine is churning for days, and that is going to drive you crazy, you might rewrite your algorithm completely to optimize for the machine to render quickly rather than yours, you to do it. So, Thinking about, and I guess this is what ChatGPT is doing in a much grander scale, but we're just going to think about if I had a list of words and I wanted to be able to query it and say, I'm going to give you a word, you're going to tell me the meaning, what would you do? Like, what is an algorithm you would write? What, okay, let's think about what is a bad process. I just put the list in random order. And then I check my, you know, a two column thing of like word and meaning in whatever order, maybe the order I thought of it. And then I say, here's my word. 
let me go down the list to see if my word matches the first column and then I'll return the meaning. What is the problem with that? I should have a dictionary, right? I should be arranging my words first. So again, starting to think about how you put your data in lists and sorting them makes what you can do with it much easier in finding it. So thinking about that philosophy. Um, because I think sometimes when we start programming, our instinct, we don't, we obviously would not do that with the dictionary now. Like, hey, I'm looking up a word and the data is sorted. I'm gonna open a random page and look for my word. Then it's not there, I'm gonna close it open another random page. But sometimes our way of programming is that. So when you're writing a program, look at it and think, am I doing that? Like randomly throwing things to try to solve the problem and hoping it sticks? Um, or am I, yeah, even when we have a dictionary and we sort the words, we then have a process to say, is my, le like, is my word starting with A through L or M through Z? So I'll open the first half or the second half. So we, we know ourselves to optimize for time, but when we write computer programs, trust me, like sometimes it just looks like I'm gonna try this and 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 don't. It's exhausting, it'll give you a headache and you will think it's hard. The goal is to make it for you to be lazy. So do that little bit of work to make yourself um, lazy. And then one last piece of how we think of storing information. Let's describe what this is. How would we get a machine to draw it? We can do two things. We can say, we're gonna draw four black lines that meet and we can give it the dimensions of the lines. And then we're coloring the inside with red. This is how we would teach each other to do it. Um, we could also think like a machine and say, I'm gonna draw a series of black pixels, a series of red pixels, a series of red, red, keep going, then black pixels. That would take a long, long time. That is how computer graphics started. We started doing that. Then someone, neuroscientist, did a bunch of studies to see how the brain described images, not in words, but just when you saw something, what happened first, and they were like, we're really good at drawing boundaries, like recognizing boundaries between things, and the fill is like this. It's completely a messy wash. That's really not accurate. But that notion that we actually think a little bit more in like dimensions as vectors and not all in pixels was really important to speed up computer graphics. Any of you who probably, most of you may not have even been alive, but who tried to do computer graphics in the early days, it was like you could hear the computer cranking and it's because it was like doing things in pixels and it was horrible. Um, so again, thinking about like clever ways of doing it. Do I wanna start here? No, we'll come back here. Um, but yeah, I wanted to mention this, one is Computer science, programming is creative problem solving. So think about how would you solve this problem? And the problem is you're trying to do something and you're gonna describe it to a machine to do it. Describe it first to yourself, a person. So describe it in words and algorithms. So the first idea is start with algorithms, take a process, write up. Algorithm is a lovely word and it's a, it just is, means process. Um, take or a procedure or a method. Um, write it in pseudocode. And what is pseudocode? Um, it's sort of the building blocks of what a computer understands as code. And we'll talk about it's just six types of things. That's all you need to do everything we can do today in the world. Um, so it says, oh, I need, this is a variable, this is a function, this is a loop. If I'm drawing a page of grass paper, I know I have to draw a series of vertical lines, so there's repetition, and then a series of horizontal lines. So I'm kind of just looping, giving the same instruction, um, sort of something rinse, repeat, um, and tell it where to stop so that you don't shampoo your hair forever. Um, the last part is to get to the syntax to actually type it in. If you can know that your algorithm makes sense, your pseudocode makes sense, the syntax will never work the first 10 times because you probably have a typo. 
But the hard part is figuring out, is it a typo? Is my logic completely messed up? So always do the last thing as syntax. Ideally, have someone else correct. The mind is very good at auto-correcting the mistakes you made. So have someone else read your code if you can. Um, and the idea then is what you end up with is a computer program. It's a set, a clear, clear set of instructions that's logically complete and correct that tells the machine what to do. And then you just wait for the results. Um, do we want it? And then I'm gonna go jump to, since we already, we don't have enough time to do the whole thing. Um, otherwise, we're gonna jump to code. Um, I sent all of you a link to all of the code so we can start doing it in processing. Um, but we're not gonna start quite yet. Um, but I tried to take all of the examples from Dan Schiffman's either learning processing or nature of code or the processing examples. I'm not that interesting in processing as a language, but in some ways it's a beautiful one, so I'll, I will tell you about it. Um, we're going to use processing today and next week for two reasons. And there are versions of processing that some people love um, that are in JavaScript, one P5, so you can do things on web. And actually, lots of processing people have moved to it. Um, why is that nicer? It's a little more accessible. You can use it on your phone. Um, it does not talk. Um, I'm not so convinced that that is an easier, nicer way to learn. Um, processing is a desktop algorithm, but it's very clean. It's a version of Java, and the results are visual, so you can code visual things. P5 does the same thing in JavaScript. There's also a version that's in Python that I've never used. Has anyone here ever used processing? It sort of feels like Python is anyway nice to code in. Why would you? translate, but maybe you can do things. Um, the one difference is the P5 allows you to do interactive web things really easily, very, very quickly. Um, processing allows you to talk, to me, the more interesting thing is allows you to do complexity a little more quickly and allows you to talk to microcontrollers and sensors and things, interact with the physical world. So if you're building installations, if you're doing something that says data visualization with live data that I, you know, I want temperature to feed in and do things. Processing is easier to code in. You are working, and it's a little more secure because you're working off of um, a drive. Um, so this is what we're covering today. Um, everything you need to do, everything in processing. Um, everything, and we're using processing. It was, oh, processing was invented. It was a very recent language, 2010, by two people um, who were grad students at MIT for the, the PhD. One was a data scientist and the other was an artist. And they were trying to figure out, can we, programming is such a powerful tool and both these groups could do really interesting, incredible things with it. And can we create a language um, that we're going to do? So what are the pieces? And well, really this should be at the end, but these are the pieces that we need. Variables and functions. So can we get, variables are just a way to say, so remember I said I had a line, then I make a smaller line, then I want to come back and do something? Well, there's no good way to tell a computer to say I want to come back and do it until I gave, unless I gave that thing a name and put it into a nice little building block of memory and told it store it because I need to come back and retrieve it. Um, functions, we've all seen functions of a certain kind in mathematics, and the, it's the way of abstracting an idea or a concept so you don't have to describe it again and again. So for example, if, I am, if I'm going to do this process over and over again, I don't want to describe the whole process of then do this, then do this. I make it a function that says, if you get this, do all of these 12 things. So it allows us to sort of abstract and build a nice closed loop. Um, logic and conditionals, um, think about if you're saying, if the temperature gets too hot, turn my image into, remember at the Winter Light Festival, someone had that thing of like, if I put my sunscreen on, then it, it turns into a beautiful piece. And so think of it, when you're thinking of like, if, I, if this happens, then do this, otherwise do this, you have to have that in any programming language. Like in this, if these criteria are met, do this thing, if not, do this other thing. And you can have as many complicated pieces as you want. You know, you can combine those in different ways, but you have to have the if, so a conditional says um, when these conditions are met, we want to do this, and it's all broken up by Boolean logic or the pieces of logic. Um, the other thing is the shampoo thing. Iteration, 
just keep doing this again and again. Um, you can have it do it again and again forever. You can say, when you get to the end, loop, do this only five times. Do this only 10 times. Again, whenever you're drawing something that has some symmetry or repetition, it allows you to repeat really quickly. Um, the other piece is the one we often don't get to early enough. Um, and I do not know why I said that, yeah. Um, which is, this is actually in processing very easy to code. Like adding noise to things so that they jitter, they don't, they don't look super regular, adding randomness so that you're like, hey, I, I'm running this animation and um, the first time I saw it in a really beautiful way was this artist Marina Zirkov, who's an animator and she makes these long, very slow animations about um, the Anthropocene and like post-apocalyptic like people just living and she has these scenes where there's something happening, there's this person sitting on a rock and he's just looking around and sometimes if you watch the same thing from the beginning, sometimes a bird flies across and like one in a hundred times he'll suddenly get up and leave the scene. And it doesn't happen every time, but it's really powerful because we are used to seeing patterns and anomalies. And so if you ever want, so you can add probability and say, you know, every time there's a one in a hundred chance this happens or a five in a hundred chance a butterfly floats across. So again, if you're an artist or if you're trying to model something in real life, you want to do that. So adding randomness, so sometimes it could be totally random, like, hey, this time I want my sky blue, but next time it might be a little gray and next time it might be a little transparent. So you can do it randomly where you have no control, but you can also set probabilities so that 75% of, you know, there's a 75% chance this happens versus a 25% chance this happens. And it's really easy to do in processing, which is one of the nice things about it. So you can get things that, see, that feel magical, that capture a little bit of a magical aspect of visual like technology. Um, the next part is modularity, um, which is imagine you're modeling an ecosystem of sorts, a forest, a solar system, something like that. You're like, okay, I have a forest. I have plants in the forest. They might all be different, but they have certain types of behavior. They're mostly green. They grow a variation of heights. They have leaves or they have branches. The branches look a little like this. There are birds or there are flowers. The flowers look like this or a solar system and there are planets and they behave this way and stars and they behave this way. Objects and classes let you describe a template for those kinds of things, so you can toss in lots of them very quickly into a thing. So instead of writing a function, it says, so an object is something that has functions. So you're like, a tree is a, there's a template for a tree, an object is a particular kind of tree. This is one of our elm trees we're gonna put in. We know it has, and the functions are leaves flutter, Maybe it has berries, maybe it doesn't. So it, the behaviors, the functions give you the behavior of how it behaves in your screen that you're making. Um, as about, when Java came out, it was kind of revolutionary. Everybody moved to object-oriented programming because it makes, modularity makes things very, very easy. It does make some things really hard and maybe you'll talk more about the some things that it makes hard or you're not gonna touch like functional programming a little bit. But uh, for example, if you wanted a, a program to evolve and change itself and rewrite things, modularity are pieces you don't touch and so it's hard to, for them to talk. Yeah, so I'm not a huge fan of it for certain kinds of problems, but it, it does allow you to create, build very rich complex ecosystems really quickly. Um, and the last thing is libraries, unlike um, lots of people have decided there, and there's one library called Generative Design that I'm going to show you. Um, the library is for physics, the library is for sound, for video. You can do all your video editing by writing programs and processing actually very quickly, um, which is sadly, for the most part, how I would edit a video. Um, but libraries, people have decided this kind of thing people want to do all the time. For example, they want 3D lighting on their world and shadows. And I'm gonna write a library that does all that so you can call it. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Use libraries appropriate code. And actually I would say the best way to program anymore, especially since ChatGPT will write programs for you. Um, 
learn to read code and simplify it first. Don't try to write your own code. Take code, muck around with it, simplify it, comment it. And that's the other thing. Comment code to tell you what to do. Do not so over comment it that you drown in all the comments and you don't see the actual thing. So I'll also, we'll also talk about how to read code and how to mess with code. So from everything from now is, um, but yeah, think of your program as just a creative way to solve a problem and to manipulate sort of data and objects. Think about syntax as just the rules of the game. And any of you played Go, for example, or chess, rules of the game are totally useless. Like especially in Go, there are very few rules, it's very simple. You'll never win a game of Go with just the rules. It's the tactics and the strategies and getting a, like a holistic overview. So really think of your program that way rather than the syntax. We start with like the, the details and the rules and we never have. So solve your problem first and then start um, coding. Visualize those consequences of the bad algorithm. Um, I'm gonna try to use all of my examples from these two books just so that you can go back and look. Daniel Schiffman has, there's no reason again for me to reinvent the wheel teaching processing, anything else I would teach with God. But he has, um, and I will show it to you um, in my many paged. Um, so I copy pasted all of these into a Google Doc that you should all have access to. Um, but there are a few websites I want to show you before we start. One is the Processing Foundation, and they have lots of examples. This, if, you're, if you don't have processing on your computer yet, download it from there. Um, do not really donate it to them. I've talked to people who are at that, and they're like, we don't expect anyone to donate anything because it's just tedious. Once in a while, someone donates $5, and we have to figure out how to go deposit and what to do with it. So they had that, that was put in there like in the old program, and nobody knows quite how to take out that button, but nobody wants to go deposit that $5. So they're like, <laughs> please, please don't donate money. Um, but they, they have, they're well funded and they do a lot of, there's also an open processing forum that you can like type questions to and people are really nice. Um, Daniel Schiffman, who in his spare time from being a full-time professor at the ITP program at NYU, um, wrote these updates, maintains the websites, all of his examples from his book, Learning Processing, are in here, all of the code is there. He also has a coding train tutorial videos on for P5, so I would definitely recommend playing with those. Um, and then we'll get to this at the end, we'll do a few examples, um, but this is how to get to really cool, complex things very quickly, generative design, again, all of the code is there. The code there is in P5, um, but if you go to that GitHub site, you can get the sketches and processing. It also takes about three, almost, it takes about three minutes to take that code and replace it with, pro you know, to change the five lines you need to change to make it work as processing code and vice versa. Um, but you can do really, um, really elaborate cool things very, with very few lines of code. And that's, that's really like, if you have to take one thing out of this, like coding done well, like five lines of code and you can have something really complex and it allows you to be clever and lazy. Um, so, I'm gonna switch between, I, I'm not gonna to go to this page so much, but the code is all on this page so that you can just copy paste. Well, I'm gonna to go to the, the sketch thing um, and I'm gonna go mention this. So let's start with a few examples just to get like our sort of do some code mental kind of calisthenics. Um, so, and I'm gonna maybe try to read the code before we, this is commented so it makes it easy, but maybe we'll tell, um, tell the machine sort of 3.2, 3. so we're gonna look at 3.2 and 3.4, and I'm actually gonna look at it in live code, so why not just put it in there? Um, I probably have example 3.2. I switch to a Mac and like weird things pop up because the, the, the mouse and the keyboard is so different. <sighs> Good God, people. I don't know why I copied this and not that. This is my Google Doc. 
Um, so I'll tell you how to read code and how to, what to ignore. Um, so anything with those two lines before it is a comment. It's just written for you or for us. So when you write your programs, um, ignore, this is there for, to tell you what to do. Um, and I started with not that first program. The um, other piece of it to ignore is the void setup. That is an internally built function. It's one of the like sort of foibles of the language. It's like, in a way, we start with a capital letter in English. It's, there's no good reason for that. The, you know, the capital letter or the punctuation will work, but we, it's just the rules of the language. So what's in setup is just saying, this is my screen, my background screen that I'm creating. It's processing programs are called sketches because the result is, is a visual thing. Um, if you look at P5, it'll instead say create canvas. Um, to make it very clear that what you're doing. Um, if you change the numbers of this uh, in here, it just changes the size. So if I play this, well, let's look at it. Do not read a program from top to bottom. It's not English. The meat of the program is sort of the thing you're doing, which is in here. The things at the top are there to set up the context or the framework to do them. So when you're reading a program, read here. What does it say? It says, I'm, this is the part that matters. So I'm gonna delete my, um, we don't know what, the, notice the colors, the blue things that appear in blue on your processing screen just say this is a built-in function. The things that appear here, are these are built-in variables into the system. And you can guess what this, variable is. It says this is the X position of your mouse. This is the Y position of your mouse. Um, and this says, this is the thing that matters. Draw a rectangle at your X position of the mouse at the Y. This tells it that X and Y is that center rather than the top left. Processing defaults to top left corner. So this says, no, no, this is my center of my rectangle. This is the width. This is the height of the rectangle. So I'm really drawing a square. I'm filling it with this weird gray color. The stroke zero is the border. Where draw says do it, there's no reason for a draw, but you'll see a little bit why I have a draw there. And then it's not gonna work or do anything I'm guessing when I try to do this, but let's see. Um, and this is the screen size. This says the background is white. Um, RGB colors, you can switch to CMYK, you can switch to HSB if you think. Um, it's, okay. Um, so, I'm gonna do, where is my background? Um, I love that I, yeah. Um, I'm gonna leave this background and let's make the screen a little bigger so we can see what happens. Um, the reason they do small screens in all of the examples is because it's using energy a little bit. So if it's just an example, it doesn't matter. Um, so if one will make the screen a little bigger, so it just says wherever your mouse is to draw a rectangle. Notice I'm drawing many rectangles, why? Because if you put a draw in there, that's an infinite animation. It just says keep doing this every time. Um, I'm gonna move, um, but notice also this should give you an idea. You've just created a very simple way with very few lines of code to make yourself a paintbrush. You don't need to draw, you could draw dots, you could draw thin lines and make yourself washes. So if you start having functions and objects, you're like, instead of every time drawing a rectangle that's mostly the same shade of gray, I could allow it to pick colors. I could, I could pick colors. I could give it a variable and input and say, 
now I want to draw a green line, and now I wanted to paint with an orange thick brush. So just this piece repeated with all of those things, with the conditionals, with color, with variables, with functions, could give you a whole painting palette, which is Photoshop, I guess, yeah. Um, processing does work in Now what happens, that semicolon is really important. Half your pro programming errors is that you will forget the semicolon um, and then it doesn't see the end of the line. So what if I put my background here and play, what happens? I have one rectangle I'm moving around. I'm basically creating a mouse pad, mouse, a cursor. Right? What is the difference? When you put it in set, set up, that's the scope is the whole program. So it says, make a white canvas, and then this keeps drawing rectangles. Every time I move my mouse, it's drawing a new rectangle. So it's following. Does that make sense? And the canvas stays the same. If I have the canvas in here, it says, draw, when I get here, clear the background, draw the rectangle. When I move the mouse again, it's repeating this, clear the background, draw the rectangle. So where things are really, really matters, okay? So if you want something to be true all the time, put it in setup, very little goes in there. Um, but does this make sense now? Like, not, did I just lose something? I lost connection, let's, let's try it again. Okay. See, the technology is like yank it, pound it in, yeah. Um, but do not read, like we get lost in this, find out what it is you're actually doing and that's the part to comment. And this is the one line that matters in all of this. You're drawing a rectangle, this tells it what colors and flavors and make it pretty, and then the rest of it is just structure. Did anyone change? Now, what if I didn't want just, I wanted an RGB. I, who knows what color that is. And I have my red thing. I could draw a circle. I could instead define my own shape and draw that. Um, I can add transparency. So instead of trying to say, here's the syntax for transparency, just like try the thing that seems natural. Um, so you can add transparency. I'm like, you know, I kind of want some blue. I, I don't want any, I want, you know, no red, maybe. And I want green, but I want my blue to change every time. So let me say it's between 73 and 250. So I'm like making up an RGB color and it's gonna pick a different range. And so suddenly it's picked a blue. Um, but you notice every time it's changed, it, it's not, it's only doing this once, it's not changing that thing. So we want to figure out how do we, but the next time I pick, um, it's going to do something maybe a little different. So really start using, changing what, in, what it is. Um, this is going to change the shape of the object. So the best way to learn to code is find examples that are simple enough that you want to work with. No, I don't want to save this, this was just made up. Um, find examples that was simple enough that you want to work with and change things you want it. And you can very quickly get to very complicated things. And, and um, if we have time during those lab hours, if people want to come and do like, I want to do a whole cityscape where the lights are moving or there's like, yeah, um, I'll happily have lab hours to do that. And once we do the programming with Arduino and Teensy, we can talk about that. Um, why am I in here? Is this my, where's my processing window? Did I lose my processing window? Yeah. Um, I want to do the, the next version of it, which is like, 
ah, oh, but I don't want a rectangle. I want a digital, I want a pencil. Um, and I thought I made a digital pencil, which is the same. It's, there's no way to get these sketches to come up full thing. And you notice this is even simpler. Um, let's make a canvas bigger. This is a white canvas. I wanted a black pencil. And I want to draw a line from where the mouse was before. Notice again, it's not, it's sort of intuitive. Processing has done at least that effort. P is the previous mouse position to the current mouse position. So as I drag my mouse, it's following it. So wherever the mouse was to wherever it's next, it's joined. And suddenly I have a pencil. It's like such a lazy way of creating your online sketchbook. Um, you can save a sketch. You can add a, a little one line of code that just says save this frame so you can save the result. You can save as many frames as you want, make yourself an animation or a video or a GIF and stitch the frames together. There's even a line of code that if you insert the frames, we'll stitch a video out of it. Um, so it allows you to start doing digital images, creations, very, very animations really quickly. Um, and you know, I, I have played with Illustrator and it takes me a long time to even get to this and it's a mess and I really don't want to save it. This is just a line of code. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to save it. I don't feel bad that I wasted time. But yeah, it's literally one line of, let's stop the program. It's literally the line of code that tells you, draw a line from the previous mouse to the previous. So as you move your mouse around, it's just drawing points, a, a small, 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 small lines. Isn't that lovely though? That like, it's just, it, I mean, it's not the most beautiful program, but it's like so little effort. Uh, don't save. So what, what are the next thing maybe we want to do? Um, we add, you know, I showed you how to change shape and add color and um, what is 3.5? Don't think about interactivity. Mouse pressed and key pressed. Um, we, I mean, in a way the previous two were interactive. We, I don't know why I have this as separate, so let's skip this so that we can do something interesting. Um, we had those ones where as you move the mouse, it responds. You can also have it like, you know, when you hit the letter A, do this. When you hit the letter B, do this. When you hit a uh, space bar, do this. You can have a thing that clears the screen. Um, you can do that. But the next, next piece is variables. Um, you want to store information and keep track of it. So what is an example of, of wanting to do that? Um, I will bring the bouncing brick into play soon. I don't know why, but like in one of Schiffman's thing, he's like, oh, I'm gonna do a bouncing ball, but it has it doing left to right. And then he has a brick with gravity that bounces up. And I'm like, maybe that should be a ball. Basically. Um, but I have my bouncing brick. Um, where's the random painting? And one of the, this is why one doesn't compute in public, because it's like, I have all this here, but it's in some random. Well, this is easy enough. It's example 4.7 in the, in the processing book. I don't know why the dictionary is on. Let's copy, um, paste. And is that, we were trying to figure out if I, if the font is big enough that you can read, but can you read that? Yes. Okay. And you have it hopefully on your thing. Is everyone following? Are you, and hopefully you're not following. You're like, change, you know, distracted by changing things and seeing what happens. Change everything in a program. That's the only way to, to really understand it. So these are all have that same boring. We'll start with the same setup. Um, so this, 
is variables. And variables can appear in multiple places. They're just places to store information to keep track of values so you can change it. So for example, you're like, you want a counter that says do this step 10 times. The name of that counter will be a variable so that each time it's keeping track of how far it is. You're like, do this so many times. If you have a score in a game, that's gonna be a variable. Um, anything you're assigning values to and you want to retrieve them later so that it's not just live, um, you're like, okay, I want to fill, I, I call this, oh, that's why I couldn't find it. it. It's not a random painting. I called it not Jackson Pollock. Um, let's think of what I'm doing here. I'm drawing a circle. Ellipses are circles if these two values are the same. If you want it to actually be an ellipse, you change this thing. This is the center of the circle. This is the radi diameter. You like to draw a circle, fill it with these values. Those values are letters. So again, if you want to run this program a thousand times, you don't want to each time type in every place the red R appears, what the thing is. So you type it in all at once on top so that when you're changing it, you're just changing it up there. So there are two ways to do it. Here it's static. You can just change it there up on the top. You can instead make it a function and you can say when you press this key, this happens, this fills that value for this. Um, so it says, take a random position on the screen. Um, random just is a random function. Width is the entire width of the screen. Height is the entire height. Remember the pink things are pre-drawn. It says it doesn't want a boundary for my circle. This is the color RGB and transparency that it wants to fill with. And random 255 means pick from zero to 255. If you definitely want something in there, say pick from 100 to 255, 100. You could put two ranges. But if you just put the upper range, it starts at zero. So what does this do? What does this do before running it? Yeah, it, it has random circles of random sizes all over the page. So it's like you're throwing paint at a thing. And that's not attached to mouse, so it's just doing it. It's just doing it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be interactive. It could have it just run, so you could create animations that don't need you at all. Um, and the more complicated your drawing is, it could do things. But this is a very simple, easy use, like understanding of variables. It says, you tell it first, this is a variable, like a place in memory. You have to tell it what kind of information it's storing. Float is storing a number. Int is storing a number. It could be an image. You can store images in memory. You can store videos. You can store strings of text. Um, and this is all it's doing. And then now you're telling it, OK, pick a variable, pick a number here. You could even have it be interactive and have someone tell it, but here you're asking it to assign itself numbers and then you're drawing your thing. But the variables allow us to change things only in one spot when we can use it 23 different times and to keep track of it. That's really basic. Yeah. The word void It means it's a special kind of built-in function that the language knows um, in Java. It's, it's sort of a, a foundational function. Because like, it's not there in every program. You would not call a function that. It's a very specific built-in function that says clear sort of everything and set this, like this is gonna be your background. You don't, no, no, not quite. You don't want to ever use a void function. Like in the processing program for the most part, unless you're really trying to do other things. If you're gonna code in Java, you'll use it. But if you're gonna code in processing, these are the only places it'll pretty much show up. Yes. Okay. But I don't know, um, when you do more, more complicated sort of things. 
Um, and you might not, you don't have to. And this is the other thing. They, um, Schiffman does overuse. You could set the, do the, all of, probably most of this you could avoid. The draw is useful because it's asking you to sort of, it's kind of creating this animation that's just an infinite loop and it's repeating. Um, but you could get away with not using a lot of, uh, to have a very static program that doesn't do either of those things. Um, often it's not required to do them. Um, do you want to jump in, Matt? Yeah, it's a special kind of weird. Yeah, but you don't usually ever add void to anything that you want to. In Java, you would, but in processing, I don't know that one really ever. I've never actually added it. And like P5 doesn't use it at all. It calls it function screen or function create canvas. Like the setup is create canvas and function draw or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't even. It has a completely different syntax, which I don't know why it did. It still based on the same thing, yeah. Um, I think there's a default frame rate which might be at 30, um, and then you can slow it down and speed it up. So you can make it kind of like very splattered. You can also change the shapes of the ellipse so that the faster like the frame rate is or the less transparent it is, it comes out as more of a splatter or something like that. Yeah, you can start mucking around. But yeah, you can, you can make, um, you can make these. Uh, you can make it as slow as you want it to be, or as far. You can speed it up quite a bit if you want it. Um, and for some things you want to do that, and some things you don't. We'll do a random one where I'll show you like what happens when it's super fast, and you can see things and super slow. Um, No, it's, it's showing you it's live computation. Okay. If you want to do a video, um, there is usually, somewhere in there, there's an animate tool, but there's also an animate library that basically says whatever I get, like make it an animation. Um, but you can also just write a line or two of code saying save frame or save every fifth frame. Um, and then it'll save um, for every, We'll do a couple of examples. For every sketch, it'll create a data file, and that's where you would upload your own data. So if you wanted to manipulate text, you would put the data into the text string. If you want to manipulate an image, which we'll do a couple of examples, you'll put that in your data file, and that's where it's looking. But when you save frames, it's saving into that data file. So you just go into your fold, the data folder and take whatever frames you want. Um, but it is a really quick way, you can see, of generating images or generating potential GIFs or animations or videos that are really, really quick without doing much work, which if you're like doing an installation and you want things coming up really quick, you know, you want to generate content really quickly, but making a really careful video is hard, you can do. Yeah. Um, Yeah, you could put that into a conditional. So you could say, um, you could put a counter. This is where a variable comes in and we'll maybe hard code something like that in a little bit. You could add a counter that says, and make that a variable and like create a variable at the beginning that's a C and it's a counter. And then let say, you know, if C is greater than five, then refresh. And if not, increase C by one. Like if C is greater than five, then rewrite the background. Otherwise you won't. So you could put the um, background 255 into the draw and then say if C is greater than, like write a little loop saying for C equals one to five, don't do anything. Um, or if C is greater than five, then do this. Otherwise let C equal, do this and then reset C to zero and otherwise don't do. So, so something like, I'm not gonna write it in syntax, I'm writing it in pseudocode, green is not a good pen. The red pens work the best somehow, right? Writing closes, um, if C is at least five, you know, then, 
make the background white or whatever color we want um, and sort of else. Um, oh, make the background white and reset C to zero. Um, otherwise, nothing. Just do the rest of it. So yeah, you can add a conditional that says every five frames reset the background, but don't until then. Can you do it where um, once the background is filled with color, so there's no like white the original background, can you reset it then? Or like, you would have to. That would be much more complicated because it's not seeing what's there, right? Like it's not seeing what it's drawing at all. And in theory, you could say after like. 50, after we draw 50 circles, do it, but it technically could have drawn them all white and not change the background. So there's a probability that you're making a guess there. I mean, it's unlikely that it draws so all it white. So it. it can't it's see it. Like you can write a whole set of code that says taking an image, do a, a hue analysis. So you could make that into a, con and there's, I'll show you, I was, one of the generative design examples takes that like, takes an image, because processing sees everything in pixels. So you could have it take the image and say, if 90% of the pixels are not white, then do, the, then do this. But it takes a significant work to see, count what every pixel color is. So it's a, it's a, this might be, a, yeah, just say every 20 steps, yeah. I mean, if you really were doing some like proper work and you wanted to do a pixel analysis, you can for an image. Um, remember the generative design page we looked at briefly? One of those um, programs somewhere in there I thought I took it from there, but maybe I wrote it. But I, you can write a program that does a hue analysis. Um, or, yeah, pixel analysis. And then you can take the pixels and randomize it, or you, know, you can scramble it. Or you can say, I'm taking this image, and every fifth pixel, I'm gonna replace it by its like duplicate color or something, or by a letter and put in your like secret message in there that no one can read or something, yeah, so. There are reasons to do hue analyses that are, um, maybe this is, yeah, this program maybe. This is, you notice this will default to opening in the P5 editor. Um, but it takes your image and then it's sort of saying, I'm gonna break it up by pixels, but it's giving you very like granular. But if you go in, you're like, if I press six, it sorts colors on hues and then run the program. And if I press um, eight, it sorts colors on brightness. So there are, you could, I would just take that and muck around with it and see, but um, it's program number P12201 in the generative design. But it has the code to like sort by pixels. Yeah, so you can analyze the pixels and see if it's one. Um, or you can be lazy and just say, it's likely after 50 times it's, it's splattered enough paint and clear it. But it's a really lovely way of very quickly coding to get visuals that are, are nice. Um, oh, let's look at the bouncing. Why does it not want to quit? Don't say, well, maybe that's why. Um, did I do the gravity example or did I call it bouncing brick? Um, so this is, there are two things in this. One is it has all sorts of things. It has um, variables. It has, um, How would you model movement in something? What does it mean for something to move? And if you're doing any kind of animation, any kind of game, you kind of want a lot of that, right? So how do you model movement? What is actually happening if a ball is bouncing? What is actually happening to it? Here's my ball. If I want it to bounce, what's changing? 
Yeah, so the, for the for movement is purely modeled by a change of position. And so this is where you would either want a loop or an if-then. It says you want this to go like if you just have a bouncing ball, you're like, what does it mean to go from here to here? The y value decreases. So you subtract y as it's bouncing downwards. Um, and then, and the speed tells you how many pixels it's jumping at a time. So the speed for what we think is just from its position, how many pixels to move at a time. When you hit the bottom, so you want to test again a conditional. When you hit the bottom, you want the speed to turn negative. So it's negative this way, it's positive this way because the y value is increasing. If you want to um, add gravity to it or something like that, then the speed has also to be changing over time. So you take your, um, so your position is changing by speed. That's what the y equals. So speed is just a variable that tells you how many, how many, um, pixels to jump at a time from the perspective, that's what speed is. And then sort of the acceleration is what we're calling gravity here. It says, so this changes position and this changes the speed each time, if that makes sense. It's just how much you're, how many pixels, how much you're scaling your speed by. The speed is, like gravity just means it's how much the speed is changing by. Right. And so it's still just another variable. But it's just going to be slower, smaller. And so it says you start with your ball or your square, the bouncing brick. You display it. Then this tells you the next location. So it's falling or going up. If speed is negative, it's falling. If speed is positive, it's going up. You add gravity to speed to say it speeds up as it's falling. And then when you hit the bottom, notice height is the bottom. Processing counts from the top left. And then you change it. So at least you can model gravity. You can model a speed. But you notice the variables are all changing to change the gravity in this world just involves one change at the top. And let's see what happens if we, if we made gravity much more powerful. Notice it's still not quite right because it's not slowing down over time. So then we would maybe want to add some friction or something, another little. So you can slowly, um, are you going to do physics? I, there is a physics library. So you can slowly start adding physics sort of concepts in so that your modeling is a little more realistic or it's unrealistic because you choose to be rather than because you have no idea how to make it model realistic things. I'm also not quite clear why we are bouncing a brick, not a ball. Like he has balls and so many things, but this is a bouncing brick. I, yeah, um, it's quite lovely to me that I'm so completely unreal. But you notice there are a few things we're doing here. We're using a movement is completely just position change. There's no fundamental physical concept. That didn't do anything. Yeah, there. Uh, movement is just phys position change. Physics is just changing variables. And then we're using a conditional here that if, if you hit the bottom, reverse the direction of the speed, make it negative or so now we have movement, we have conditionals. We'll do a little more with conditionals, but we want to do a function, um, which is the bouncing ball. Um, why do we want functions now? Because it's nice if we only want to bounce one ball, right? Um, but what if we wanted a whole bunch of balls bouncing down? And why would we want that? Um, because that is basically the principle of most games. Um, right? It's that 
53 things are coming at you, you have to catch it, you have a score. So we want to be able to create multiples. And so we want to abstract what something is so we can like change its behavior very simply. So, and maybe we want ball items which work one way. So we talked about classes and everything, but a function tells you what are its properties of this one object. And so a ball in this case just falls and bounces but maybe it could also be caught and we can have a property of what happens when it's caught or maybe it has a property. Um, so let me put this in. I think when I change the window size, it glitches, oh, who knows why it glitches out. Um, so it says, I don't wanna write all of this about the ball, I'm gonna abstract it a little bit. So what does a ball do? It moves up and down. And when it hits a wall, it bounces. So the properties of a ball, so you can think about it as if I was drawing, if I had a function describing what a planet does, what would I want it to be? Yeah. Yeah, so, one, it exists, it's displayed. So that could be the size, the color, the shape. And we could in fact have just variables because every planet we know is a, an ellipse and we could give it a, a diameter and a position and a shape. We know it rotates around an axis. So we want to model that. Um, and we know it kind of revolves around the sun. So we want it to spin and we want it to move in an orbit. So if we said, okay, here's this thing that is a planet and it exhibits three behaviors, these could each be functions so that for each planet we don't have to divide this up in scratch. In detail, we just give it a function with variables and say, we will call the display function for this planet and give it what size it is so that it exists. We will call the rotate function and we will call the ripple. So it's a way again of abstraction of, so that you can then, when you create a new planet, you give it its own size. You don't have to rewrite all the code. Again, being lazy. So you can think of this bouncing ball as just, it moves up or down, bounces what happens when it hits a wall, and display just means it exists. Um, so the move is that y function. The bounce is the height, the conditional. So the same thing we did last time. And the display is just draw the circle. So it's exactly what we did last time, but this allows us to create 10 million bouncing balls that all behave differently if we want to. Or to change all of these things without doing anything. Notice it's doing exactly the same thing, except this one is a ball, not a brick. Um, but this allows us to say there's more, you know, we can create lots of balls. We can create different sizes, shapes, colors, different speeds. Um, and so a function is just an, is a way to capture behaviors of a larger sort of a template of objects. Um, we did some conditionals, I wanna come back to them, but I want to, um, we haven't done loops yet, so I wanna talk a little bit about that, and then we're gonna come back and deconstruct and we're gonna make a whole thing of raindrops and change um, patterns and things. Um, let's move away from, Oh, I put functions or loops on the wrong side of um, probabilities. Did I just say 5.9 in that? 6.9. Um, I'm wondering why I don't have it in a linear way. I never follow my notes linearly. This is the most like you'll ever see me following like my slides at all. Um, that's a very boring example. Let's not do that. Let's get to a 
think I had better loops than he had, so I just ignored it, but I'm now trying to remember whether I wrote it down or not. Um, or whether I skipped and just went to objects and classes, because that's more fun. Um, oh, maybe I mixed probability and ra um, probability with my loops, um, which is fine. So if you look at the probability, randomness, and noise, um, we'll talk about loops, but I want to get to objects and classes, and I want to get to recursion. We're going to draw one fractal by the end of today, because otherwise, what's the point? Um, not that the non-fractals are very bad, but um, it's nice to see what... This probably had a name in my folder and I can't remember it anymore. But I chose all of these like in the last three days, so I know. Okay, so loops. Remember that thing at the beginning where we were trying to draw a grid? There was a. This is where we go through slides non linearly. Um, so let's think of how to talk to a machine here, and we want to draw something like this, so let's draw the very basic thing. How would we do that? Now you kind of know the pseudocode for processing, so we can say this. Yeah, so we want to set our grid, say it's 480 by 480 or 500 by 500. So we're drawing, and what are we filling the background with? Let's write it in sort of semi-pseudocode. Yeah, you can pick whichever you want. You can say to do the least amount, you can, you can just pick, paint it black maybe. So your background is black. I'm not writing, I'm just writing pseudocode because it's black. And then we want a grid of red lines, right? So. What do we, how would you describe how do you draw a grid of red lines to anybody? How many lines are we drawing? Both or either. So we need eight vertical red lines. And we need eight horizontal. And they're the full width of the. And you want to tell it the weight of the lines and the interval between them, right? Yeah. So we can do a line. We have it starts at zero, goes to the width. So that part, we know how to draw each line. We tell it a color. Like we have the fill before it that says it's red. So we could do that iteratively. So you could say you start at zero, zero. You draw your first line, you increase your counter, and you go up to the bottom, and you have your last line, right? And then you reset, and then you go back to zero, zero, and you start a new if-then, and you say, here's my counter, and I'm drawing the vertical lines, right? Now, what if I had, I wanted to do, um, the white dots. So I can do this by doing an if, and you have a counter less than eight, draw red line of width going from zero to the end. And then same way of counter, then reset a different counter, and that's less than eight, do that. So I'm trying to like, how do you draw the white dots? So I want to draw, I start at zero, zero, and keep increasing the x by 10 and draw a white dot till I hit the width. What do I then want to do? I want to repeat it, but I have to like come back. 
Yeah, so I kind of want to reset my counter, come back to the first one, and then draw. So I kind of want a loop. So you could do it if then, but if then it takes too long. And so we do a loop that says count it, and then we do a nested loop. While I'm here, draw all of these, and then while I'm here, draw all of these. Um, and the same thing you could ask, what if instead of coloring each of the squares black, I wanted a different color in each square? So I want a grid. How do I work with a two by two grid? And so we do nested loops. Um, so again, they allow you to make things very, very simple. So this is exercise six, eight in the processing. Um, Oh, good God, that's like minuscule. Let's make it 800, 800. And I have a, a loop. So I'm gonna, this is, it says color each little square, one shade of gray. So if I look, I'm gonna get rid of the image. What does it say to do? I'm coloring, drawing a rectangle filled with a random shade of gray. When am I doing it? What is changing? The, the width, these, this is just a 10 pixel by 10 pixel rectangle. Um, it doesn't have a boundary and it's X and I positions are changing. So with the nested for loops, it says start at X equals zero. While X is zero, pick a Y, start at Y is zero, so top left corner, color your first rectangle. Go back, x is still rate of zero because we're inside this loop. Now you increase y by 10 pixels. So we're drawing, we're coloring vertically. And when I get to the bottom, when y hits the height, you increase x by 10 and you start the same interior loop and you start coloring the second column of dots. So notice this is coloring column by column. You could flip the order of the loops and it'll color row by row. It isn't always true that the order of the loops doesn't matter, but loops allow you to repeat something a finite many times. You can also use a while loop. I've never quite understood why we need both, but sometimes one just leads to cleaner code than the other. I would say use the one that just occurs naturally to you and it feels cleaner. And it says, while X is less than width, keep changing Y and drawing, and then do the same thing otherwise. I, it, like something like this is such a simple task for it to do. It's if the task has it involving a lot more computation and a lot more um, thinking, memory, like it will, it can um, churn. Okay. There's no limit to the nesting Yeah. And notice I just added color without really thinking it through at all. Um, and then, I hate live coding because I'm bound to make some like um, syntax error. But if you want to really irritate, create things, and then here, this is where the frame rate matters. Um, so you can see the difference between a static code. I kind of just wanted to add that. Um, so you can see what this is doing. This is, a, it, it keeps repeating it. Draw just says keep doing it. I could put a, a counter in the draw and stop it after 10 steps. Um, I, again, should I, where does the frame rate go? Yes, this is it. Now processing has this, and this is a Java thing. Like, why is the R capital not the F? But like, I think it's something like that, you know? Um, does that seem like an actual line of code? Let's stop whatever I'm doing. Let's see if it does it slowly. See, then that slowed it down. This is what I mean. I never, like, is the F capital, is the R capital, both, neither? So if you don't have the draw, it's not repeating. This is constantly redrawing the pixels. Like, this is going through the whole loop, and then when it gets to the end, it's starting over and it's going through and starting over. Without the draw, and that's why I was like, it's, don't worry about the void part, just 
thinking about what this does if you, the frame rate is irrelevant, really. Um, if you're really never going to use something, delete it. Um, this is the thing that annoys me about code, about appropriating code. It is good to take someone's code and hack it, but like the first thing to do is take deleting chunks of it and seeing if they're even relevant, because they probably took someone else's code and just added their lay on. If you can get your code down to the simplest thing you can get that does the thing you want to do. Um, and you don't want to necessarily do just this, but you can start saying, you know, the, you don't want total randomness, but maybe you want a background that like is, is changing a little bit and you want, it doesn't have to just purely be a grid. You can have dots, you can have like more elaborate, you can have creatures, but like the loop, this, just this code allows you to do some very complex moving backgrounds very, very quickly. Um, And maybe you only want shades of green or something like that because it's a landscape or maybe shades of sand or something. Um, but the loop, the for loop, the nested loops allow you to do a lot of things with just, you're just telling it to draw one thing and the loop allows you to cycle through lots of things. Again, the laziness, um, focus on the laziness. But yeah, I, I tried to pick what were sort of typical examples that like you like get a flavor of what all is possible. Um, and I wanted to, oh, we, we should do, we'll, do I wanna do probabilities? That, is, that, that one I took the code from somewhere and I do not like it because it's such ugly like visuals at the end. But maybe, um, maybe I do want to use some, um, So I'll, we'll come back to noise maybe, but I wanna go to um, object classes and arrays. So uh, this will tell you how to do lots of things that have simple behavior. There are two examples there. One is a raindrop. We'll come back and do probability and noise and we'll end with doing our fractals, recursion, because all of these pieces, once you have them, it's so easy to do so much. Um, oh, I also do not like, um, you will see this in other processing code and maybe you'll see it in, I don't like having multiple tabs. Notice there's a, um, another window here, a potential to add a new tab. Um, and it's, it's good practice if you have really complicated things. So it's traditional if you have lots of, when you go to objects and classes, to put each class in a different tab. So for example, if you're designing a whole ecosystem, you have a planet class and a star class and a satellite class, and you put them all in different tabs and the main tab will call all of them. Um, the scope in which it does it, processing the scope of what variables apply to goes from top to bottom and left to right in the tabs. Um, if there's just one class, I like to put it at the bottom because I hate clicking tabs. It makes, especially if you have a phone, especially if you have, um, so I like my code in one line because then I can see what everything is without jumping back and forth. So this is where um, I'm gonna play this so you can get a flavor for what it is. Um, and I'm combining three things um, because I'm lazy. So the question is, you only want classes and objects when you have lots of them. And a nice way to organize them is something called an array, which is the worst word in the world because we have, a, um, it's not an array, it's a list. So array is for whatever reason, processing's really irritating way or Java's irritating way of saying list, um, an ordered list basically, um, and objects and classes. So this is where you make things modular. You're like, that's all very great. If I have a ball, functions tell me the behaviors or if I have, a planet, the functions tell me the behaviors of the planet. But you're like, what if I had five planets and I had satellites and I had whatever. So suddenly when you have an ecosystem, you want things to be modular. And so you have objects and classes. And so an, a, a class is a template for the type of thing. And an object is an instantiation of a class. So for example, planets and satellites are really part of the same class and different objects maybe and functions are the behavior of that object. So this is called stripes, so it should tell you, maybe. So 
And an array is a list. So all this does is, I do not know why processing likes tiny, tiny screens, but I guess it's just the, if you're doing it on your tiny little phone tablet thing. Um, also, I was gonna say, take, there's a huge amount of really cool free processing code, but try to understand it and like bring it to me if you want or like during those lab hours and say, I wanna use this, but I want it to do this and not this and like we'll figure it out so that you don't have to write everything. But you notice the code I'm using is doing complicated enough things, but it's very simple. So what does this do? We described it. And then they do something a little more. So we have a whole bunch of stripes, basically, because they have some width to them. And so this is our class, the template for what a stripe does. A stripe has a location, a speed that it's moving, and a width. All the stripes start at zero. They have a, we're giving them a random speed. Um, and then here are the functions that the stripe has. It exists, it displays, um, it moves. So the stripe object has these behaviors, which is our functions, and it has a rollover behavior. If you noticed, when I move the mouse over it, it, light, it the color changes to white, so it kind of highlights. So you're basically creating this class of objects um, they're stripes, they have behaviors, which are functions, and we're just combining all of it. It's, this is where the syntax like thing, it's that we want to do lots of stripes. We don't want the stripes to be identical. We want them each to have properties and behaviors. They might move at different speeds, they might have different sizes, and, but they have consistent behaviors. They all highlight, they all move from left to right, they all start at the left end. And so it's like sort of classifying species or something like that. They all, the functions are the behaviors of the properties of the species um, and the species is the object or class. Um, the object is just the instantiation, the existence of a specific thing in that class. So the class is the abstract template, the object is the thing that we are making. Um, usually it takes till about probably week 12 or the second quarter to get to class an object, so an hour and a half is kind of not too bad. Um, so I, I don't expect us to understand all of it, but just thinking of it as we created one bouncing brick. What if we wanted to create a whole series of things raining down from the sky? Some are bricks, some they move at different speeds, they, they have different shapes and sizes. Why would we want that? When, when we're doing CGI or landscapes, we want it. But when we're doing a game, I mean, a lot of this, you can make games out of processing, and you're like, oh my God, there are you know, all sorts of things falling from the sky, and we have to shoot at some of them, we catch some of them, we do things, and then you, uh, you, you're like, what does it mean to catch something? You're like, oh, I have a hand object, or a mitt or something, and what does it mean to catch something that's falling from there? It says, Somehow I'm moving horizontally, that's moving vertically, and when the shapes overlap in position in some ways, that means we've caught it. You know, so you have to start interpreting what it is we do in the physical world to a two-dimensional screen. We're like, isn't there like the apple basket thing, like there's like apples falling down or something, and you have a basket moving at the bottom, you're trying to catch as many. And it's that, that the basket objects get to only move a certain have behaviors, the, the apple objects have behaviors, and then we have a, a function for both, that is one is catch and the other is caught, and it basically means they overlap. And then we have a score that says, when there's this overlap, up the counter, that sort of thing. Um, so there are lots of different reasons. Like I said, some are just to make little games, but some are just to make complex landscapes without saying, you're like, I want to make 10 million flowers, but I won't, don't want to sit and draw each one. Um, I want a whole bunch of flowers. I'll specify like number of petals, color, size, 
shininess, I don't know, when they flower and when they don't. Like you can add timers in time. You can take a real clock and embed it. You can take a calendar so you can set it to do things by real time and get information, which is really also kind of cool. Like you're like, if it's morning, I want these colors or these things to show, if it's evening. So, and they're all conditionals. You're just taking a library that says incorporate time from your machine's clock or they, yeah. So all of it is possible to code. There's some things that, yeah, you, it is kind of a live program. It's not a, um, you don't pause it, yeah. They invented this, uh, when they came up with this, their goal was just how do we teach programming so that artists realize it's an actual really powerful creative tool. Um, and this was the language, and it is true, it's a good gateway language. They imagine once artists started coding, they would jump to Python or something. It's just eventually artists realized, like especially the people who started coding and processing creative technologists, including Casey Reyes, who came up with it. He's a professor of digital media arts at UCLA now. He realized you can just keep coding and processing and like do quite a bit as an artist and you don't have to. Um... So this is a thing saying, okay, what does a raindrop look like? Um, I'm creating an array, a list of drops, and I want a thousand drops. I'm going to give it, what does it do? It says, move and display raindrops. Um, you can then add a catcher to it or a counter or whatever. You can say, oh, I want these raindrops to be the same color. They're going to move down. When they hit the bottom, they disappear. Um, and new raindrops start. Um, and I wrote, so this is not that interesting. We have raindrops, right? And then they fall. Um, but you can say, OK, I want my ellipse to be like, notice sees the color. And maybe I want to pick a transparency to it. Or I want some randomness so I can create another thing that ac acquires um, randomness to it, but this, I can make my raindrops a little more transparent and that's a little nicer and I can, I can insert an image in the background of clouds or sky, so it's very easy to insert an image or a video as the background of your thing. So instead of your background just being a canvas that's clear, you can have an image, you can have a video, you can have an animation in the background. Um, and then I was like, well, maybe I don't want just round raindrops. I kind of want stretchy raindrops. And so you have to play around with this. This was a last minute like hack last time, so I don't know. And suddenly my raindrops at least look like drops. Yeah. So this is a little program that you can modify. No, I changed the drop. I, I wrote a little thing that made the drops ellipses and transparent and a little transparent. Just to say, notice that this is the nice thing about the abstraction or the display. I didn't need to change the whole program. I just changed one place to make it transparent and I changed another place to change the shape. Instead of having it be a circle, I changed the shape a little bit. So the nice thing about abstraction, it makes your coding much more, um, much cleaner so that when you're making changes, it's easy to know where you need to change it and change it one place and it changes it everywhere. I just touched one shape and it changed all the drops. It changed, um, didn't change. I could change the speed for all of them. Um, so it's an, it's an argument for um, function. I, and I want to do recursion because that, that is what I like to do anyway. Um, it's the complexity to me that makes programming um, worth it. Um, there's no reason to learn another language that you really can't talk to. And appropriating code, um, which we will do some generative design. Um, did I just skip recursion in here? How did I did not do recursion? Oh, yeah, so if you want to know more about complexity, take um, Nat's class. Libraries, use all the libraries, ideally. Lots of people will put up libraries in the processing page of badly written code. Usually they filter sometimes, or like just shoddy code, like just shoddy code. Um, and I put these things, with 
do people, should I just add, like, should I email you a Google page with a link to the slides? Is that like, so you can look up the examples? Um, I'm gonna do one example on recursion from, um, and then do a couple of strange examples that I just random to show you how lovely the world can be. Um, There's, there's one ex example in um, processing or the nature of code that's the very basic recursion. So this is um, why you want functions rather than not having functions. And I don't know if you, um, if we should go back to look at the first um, image that's on our, ta-da, okay. How would I write code for this? What am I doing? Yeah, so what are we seeing? We had a large rectangle and it had a color. And somehow we are mentally cutting it and drawing a, a smaller rectangle, two smaller rectangles. Remember what I said about the fractals? Um, and then I'm just repeating each time. So notice even though it would be very hard to describe this very carefully, I'm like I have a big rectangle, I'm painting it a color, I'm dividing it vertically into two and drawing a small rectangle of like, I don't know, two thirds or three quarters, coloring it. On top of that, oh yes, that's one more thing, top to bottom. If I color a rectangle and then another rectangle, it takes the later one and puts it on top. You can add transparency so that you can have that. Um, so it's not, you could design this as trice, but you're like, oh, I'm just drawing another rectangle and then on half of it, I'm drawing another rectangle and another rectangle. So how do you do that? Really all I'm drawing a is a rectangle. And if I think of that rectangle, draw a rectangle as a function, I'm just calling the same function again and again except I'm not looping, I'm doing something a little bit different. So I'm gonna show you, um, we can write this code and that may be a good lunchtime thing to do. Um, but I, I am going to show you a program here and it says, here's my program, this is all I'm doing. I'm doing something called, I'm calling this function which is draw circle. And draw circle, what does that do? That's a function. So this is where that void thing is. I'm, I'm calling this, I'm defining and calling this function. Draw circle says, draw a circle at this position x, y, r, r. Let's look up what that radius is. So this is the position, this is the radius. It's not filled and it's outlined in black. When you read code, you should think of it in words because that then gives you a picture, you can visualize it and you can draw it. So draw circle, all it does, if you can find a black pen, is just draws a black circle. But then it does one more thing, right? It says, if the radius is actually greater than two and this is inside the circle itself, it says call it calls itself. Now this is where you can get complexity. Remember that thing of we duplicate, we scale, and then we repeat. So draw circle says draw a black circle, but if my radius is big, then I'm gonna draw, call, not just draw another circle, I'm calling myself with a new position shifted to the right, a new position shifted to the left, so I'm calling myself twice, I'm drawing two more circles, this was my circle, this is my radius. So I'm shifting, the new circle is shifted to the right. Oh, or this was my diameter, I guess, not the radius. So R over two is actually the radius. Um, I'm shifting here and I'm shifting here and I'm calling myself twice. And what do those do? Those will draw a new circle of the new diameter, which is half the width. Right? Why is that interesting? Well, notice it keeps repeating and it says keep going until that 
R number. And oh, while you're doing that, you probably want to say if R is less than, bigger than two, the new R is half that size and keep going till I get something that's smaller than two and then I stop. So that's the boring one. And notice how very quickly, with just five lines of code, we've drawn something with pretty com significant complexity. If we want to see how, how much complexity that is, you're like, what if I did it on top and bottom as well, right? It would take us, without recursion, without this notion of functions, like objects and classes and, that's just repetition. But if you want complexity, you need the functions and this concept of recursion of a function being able to call itself. Because um, that's what gets us, that self-scaling replication, that's what gets us to complexity. Um, what do we think this is gonna do? That. It is, this is a huge number of circles and it has just filled the screen. So maybe like make it. So we don't even want things. That almost looks like we've just painted the thing black, but we've just drawn this enough times. Um, maybe we don't want R bigger than two. Maybe we want, maybe we want to stop this earlier because each time each of these circles is drawing four circles within itself. And so it's just filling it up really quickly. So with recursion, you can get to really, like the, the notion of the space filling curves really quickly. So now you can see, start to see what it's actually doing. Um, but then you're like, yeah, yeah, this is nice, but this is again, too much symmetry, right? So we add a little probability to it. And you'll see a lot more of this. Um, might I actually like time myself to finish on time? This is like brilliant. <laughs> I've never done this. Um, did I just, oh, but I have a few more examples, so we can kill some time. Um, not kill because we, I want a few more, but I want to show you the, um, the just one a fractal plant, and then I want to show you some noise in a generative design example. So yes, we might finish close to on time. Um, so what if I didn't want to just draw it? What if I wanted to change some things? Um, I wanted to give things Options, so I want to draw a tree. And what is a tree? Um, I want to, my function's just gonna create vectors. And it says, I'm gonna start with a line. I'm gonna give the, and then out of the line, it spawns two lines. The angles could kind of change. The lengths of these lines could kind of change. I'll give it a range, a random range. And then off of those lines, more lines come out. Um, and so it's again that same principle of, I don't want to spend too much time on this because next week you'll spend proper time on this. But um, look at that. Isn't that cool? Like with very little um, effort, you can draw yourself your nice little ferns. And I think there's a little nice key pressed functions on it. Um, so I changed the background. I did very little because I figured you'd do more interesting things next week. You can add movement to this, so there's swaying. You can say, I want to create like berries on the branches. Yeah. You had a, no, you were just stretching. But isn't this lovely? Like, at the, like very little. And this is like, these look really natural and they look beautiful. You know, the background colors, I just made it random. So they are a little like strangely garish occasionally. Um, and you can't control how dense they are, but you can keep changing it until you find a version you like. But notice how quickly you can generate very complicated images with my complete lack of drawing skills or animation. So, so it's a way to be clever and lazy. And let's look at the code again. All we did, a function that calls itself, says we're controlling the direction of the branches. We have a random range of what the length of a branch can be within a certain parameter so we don't get like totally wrong, long branches. We're changing the angle of the branches a little bit in a parameter and that's all. So, but you learn the details of that um, next week. I just wanted you to see, and look at this, less than a page of code. And you have some very nice um, things. A couple of other um, examples, one of noise that I thought was just, this is basic noise and I'll show you a more complicated one. Um, of realizing you can change if you want things to jitter so they don't look so exact and perfect. 
um, so that the position fluctuates a little bit, but you can do the same thing with a line or something, so you can start to get a sense of, um, of movement. Um, uh, I found this one, um, it's just a, this is again just a basic interactivity with functions but, uh, with variables, which is so lovely. Um, this was John Maida's design. Um, he was their advisor and he was like, oh, I think I can use processing too. Um, and so it's a very simple program and it's like a, a, a typewriter that types color. Um, so there's your typewriter as you type. Um, each, each time instead of a letter, you get a different, um, each letter is coded to a color. So you have the return screen gives you a black horizontal line. Punctuation gives you a long, like each of the long black lines are just punctuation, but it's a color typewriter. So kind of it's a very fun little like um, cute thing. You can add sound to it if you add a sound library. So every time it types a color, you can also have it play a sound so you can make yourself your own keyboard. Um, but it's a very, uh, a very simple exercise. I don't remember if I put the code for the typewriter in there, but I'm happy to add the code to that Google Doc if that's helpful, and for the fractal plant. Um, and just to give you a flavor of what's possible, and that gives you pretty much every possible start, and then once you do the, the randomness, um, the not Mondrian, this is another recursive function that makes very ugly Mondrian-like drawings. Um, every time you press a key, it generates a new one. It gives you give it the basic template of colors, and all it's doing is when it has, it starts with a big rectangle, divides it into two rectangles, takes that rectangle, divides it into two rectangles. So it's only running two steps. If you run three steps, it gets kind of little. Um, but you notice. Not bad, it's like really good value for money in terms of how much code you're typing. That's it, it's like calling itself four times. It's a function that says, take my rectangle, my square or rectangle, um, pick a random vertical spot and a random horizontal spot. That gives me four new rectangles. I'm gonna color these three and then do the same thing twice. This did it three times, that did it so this is doing it three times. We started off by doing it twice. Um, I haven't tried. Yeah, see, that's just there. Yeah. Unless you have a big wall. Um, a really cool exercise, I originally had my, my class being like two sessions, and if we have just during the project, if people want to do this as a project for the September like prototype show, um, taking Sol Lewitt's instructions for drawings and recreating them and then projecting them on all the walls, like creating a different one and creating a whole, is a really fun exercise, sort of like recreating Sol Lewitt drawings. Because um, it's, it's really just using variables, functions, some not even recursion, um, and then you project it on the walls, which is what he kind of intended that someone had to draw it on. Um, so, this is cool. In the last, I don't want to say because why not? Why should I? Um, the last um, slide I had was how do you go to complexity, um, and it had a link. It had a few different sketches from. Um, yeah, yeah. Open in Google Chrome. Um, that's that's a boring one, um, but yeah. Each time I specify the space bar, it does something different. Um, but I just wanted you go to each of those and like look at the code and it's really not that um, like this, yeah. And then see if you can match what it's doing visually. These are in P5 and we can rewrite them for processing if you want, like I said, by changing. You notice everything's exactly the same except instead of the void, it says function because that's kind of what it is. Um, and instead of set up, or like screen, it just says can create canvas, which is the background. Um, but there are a few different examples in here um, that allow you to like do flocking or swarms. There's one that is like, let's change, um, yeah, like 
drawing sort of smoke tendrils. Um, very simple algorithm. I've tried to link to ones that are relatively simple. Um, I probably, yeah, this one just follows your mouse. And then if you click your mouse, it starts a new creature that follows your mouse. Um, but you notice in like five seconds, we've drawn something that looks like it took effort. You know, um, I will say that, like I am a lazy person. I like this idea that I can draw complicated things without taking time. Um, there's one that, that does add noise to your video that's really lovely and I don't know if I have it. This one is just drawing a bunch of circles, connecting them and filling a space. And you notice the circles aren't overlapping. It's like trying to fill the space with circles of different sizes. Um, and maybe the last one I'll show you here. They put all their code online and they do have it both in processing and P5. Play with a bunch of these because they give you a flavor of what's possible and then Matt will tell you how to write the code. Um, but even something like this, like here is a, you load your image in. Um, and I wanna read this code because it has a lot of nonsense in it that you can ignore. You load your image, you have your setup and you draw. And what are you drawing? Um, you're drawing something that just adds a little bit of jitter into it. And, and then you're saving it. Notice you can save your thing. This is what you say. You're like, hey, there's a save frame option in processing. Or you can say if you press, every time you press the key S, um, save a frame. Um, and it saves it into your folder that your program is in. Um, Careful doing that in draw mode because it'll save infinitely, like insanely. So just say, save every 10th frame or save only, only save up to like so many frames. Otherwise you'll just like flood your computer. Um, but I wanted you to see what this does. It loads your picture and it slowly just makes it decay. It adds a little noise and randomness so that it starts to devolve. But it's like, gives you these really beautiful, beautiful visual effects that um, that usually in more sophisticated video editing programs take some skill. Yeah. Um, so think of this also as a way to take an image and add glitches, add, add layers, add strange things very quickly that you can, um, you can deconstruct it by pixels and scramble it. You can, there's one in here that does that. You can say, change the saturation and brightness of every fifth pixel. You can like really like customize it with just a few lines of code. But anyway, that was my how to become an expert programmer in two and a half hours. Um, so <laughs> thank you all.